greatest of the storms. You're the great king who separates the seas. The great father who breathes and life is established on earth. We bless your holy name, Abba. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to sit and throne in all human hearts, in all that listen to us this day. That your light, my Lord, sit and throne in every heart that worships with us today. Let your glory come down for your glory. Let it be in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We glorify you, Abba. And we love you, Jesus Christ.
to all our first time visitors you are welcome to connect with us follow us on all our social media platforms facebook instagram and twitter for tithes and offerings please use the mobile money and account number on your screen covenant nations church for the kingdom and the land Father, we thank you for this Sunday morning and this opportunity for us to come into your presence again. Thank you for everyone that is tuning in and joining us for this Sunday morning service. Lord, we just again invite your Holy Spirit to come and guide us on this journey that we are on today and and help us, Father, and work in us and and through us and help us to get to the place that you want us to get to this morning and help us to to begin to sing a new song in our lives and in our families father in your house in the church lord and in our, in our nations help us to to begin to sing a new song that represents the new season that you are bringing us into in the mighty name of jesus amen Well, good morning everyone. I welcome you all to this Sunday morning online service. We are continuing with the theme that we have started. Um this is now the third week of this theme, 400 days of praise. And by the grace of God, we're going to be continuing with this for uh some time to come. So, I encourage everyone to Uh, stay with us because we're going to be talking about a lot of different aspects of of praise and what does it mean. Uh we introduced this theme this topic uh in the beginning uh, two weeks ago talking about you know gates of time and last week we talked about appointments divine appointments with God and those seasons of appointments. And today I just want to briefly talk about what is the essence of praise. What is praise? What what does it mean? Many Christians mistakenly think that praise and worship, the difference between praise and worship is praise is fast songs or songs that have a a faster tempo and and worship are slower songs or slower music. We will not be going into the different types or ways that we can praise God, but today I just want to focus on some things something that is more foundational what is the essence of praise at its core what does it really mean praise is 
uh, magnifying God, praise is lifting God above our circumstances, praise is, you know, um, just exalting God and honoring Him with our words, with our songs, with, with instruments, with our hands lifted up, with, with our lives. Um, there are so many aspects or, or ways that we can praise God. But I just want to focus on something today that is, is, is more of a, a heart issue. Not, uh, I'm, I'm not looking at the, the types or the ways that we can praise God, but at the core of praise, what does, what does it mean? What does it really mean at fundamental level? And I'm going to be reading from the book of Judges, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And it says, After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given or delivered the land into his hands. And Judah, the tribe, said to the tribe of Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the allotted territory so that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will also go with you into your territory. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they smote 10,000 of them. Now, this scripture is important because the book of Judges is following uh, Joshua, and Joshua is following you know, Deuteronomy and uh, Numbers, Leviticus. And so the book of Judges marks a very important um, turning point in the journey of this nation, the, the children of Israel. It is following the death of Joshua, the servant of God, who had led the children of Israel through uh, the conquest of the Promised Land. So this is a very, very uh, important national figure, a leader who has led them through this season of conquest, and now he's, he's not with them anymore. Before Joshua, of course, there was the great leadership of Moses, the servant of God, who uh, really was a very, um, uh, he was a, a deliverer. He had a very, very strong mantle of, of leadership over this nation, and he led them for 40 years. And he led the children of Israel. God used him to lead them out of Egypt and then through the years of the wilderness. So they have come out of having these very strong leaders, national leaders that have sort of helped them transition from slavery into now their own, their own land, their own inheritance. So now Joshua is no longer there. And Joshua led them, he organized them, he, he had the strategy for, um, you know, attacking or conquering different cities, different tribes of the enemy. So this is the first time that they don't have this strong leader over them. And so what's interesting is that they did something um, very wise. They did something in their uncertainty. They were unsure of how to proceed and what they needed to do to go into battle. They had seen how Joshua had led them, how Moses led them. And so they were not sure. So what they did a very wise thing. They inquired of the Lord and they said, who will go up for us? Who will go up for us to fight against the Canaanites? And God's answer was very clear. He said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hands. So. God's instructions are, are very specific. He says, tribe of Judah should, should go up. I have delivered. And that is, is it's not I will deliver a future tense. It is I have delivered already the enemy into his hands. There's something called the law of first mention in the Bible, which says when something is mentioned the first time, every subsequent time that it's mentioned, it means the same thing. So. The, the meanings don't change. If something is mentioned in, in one way the first time, it continues to mean that same thing. So um, God says, Judah shall go up before you. I have delivered the land into his hand. And if we go according to that law of first mention, it just means that if Judah goes ahead of you into battle, um, I will deliver the enemy into his hands. There was something, it, it, was, it was not just... Um, an organizational uh, instruction. It was a spiritual principle that God was giving to the children of Israel. 
if you send Judah first, then I will give you victory over your enemies. So what was it about Judah that was that was unique? What, why? Why did God say, send Judah first? Why couldn't he say, send Reuben, who was the oldest, the tribe of the, of the oldest son of, of Jacob? Why didn't he send Joseph? Joseph had a, a very strong uh, mantle in the sons of Jacob. Why did he send Judah? What was unique and uh, different and special about what did Judah represent? So that God basically said, if you send Judah first, I will give you the victory. So who was Judah? If we look at the um, story in the Old Testament, Judah was the fourth son of Jacob from his wife Leah. Judah was uh, you know, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah inherited the position of the firstborn of the sons of Jacob after the firstborn, who was Reuben, lost that, the blessing and the position of the firstborn after he, he sinned. Judah is the tribe from which King David came from, and the uh, lineage now of, of David came out of Judah, and um, as a result, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was a, a son of David, also came out of the tribe of Judah. And the Lord Jesus is also known as the Lion of Judah. So we know from you know this history and this perspective that there was something unique about him. He, he sort of emerged out of these 12 tribes. He emerged as the leader. And from Judah came the lineage of, of David, King David. And then from King David came Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So there was something that set Judah apart. But let's go back a little bit uh, to see the, the foundations, to see who this person was on a foundational level. Because his prominence emerges over time. But I want us to look at, at the foundations. I want us to look at where he started, where his life started. So if we look at Genesis chapter 30, and it's a story that I find very, very interesting. It's a story that I really feel really talks about, you know, the character of God and, and shows, gives us insight into the way God feels and the way that God works, especially for people who are who may feel rejected or feel overlooked. And so this story is a wonderful story that I really love because it shows a, a part of God's character that is truly, truly wonderful. Genesis chapter 30, verse 27. And this is talking about Jacob and Leah and Rachel. We're going to read uh, verse 27. And Laban said, It is not permitted in our country to give the younger in marriage before the elder. Finish the wedding feast for Leah, then we will give you Rachel also, and you shall work for me yet seven more years in return. So Jacob complied and fulfilled Leah's week. Then Laban gave Rachel his daughter as his wife. And Laban gave Bilhah his maid to Rachel his daughter to be her maid. And Jacob lived with Rachel also as his wife, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban another seven years for her. And when the Lord saw that, that Leah was despised, he made her able to bear children, but Rachel was barren, and Leah became pregnant and bore a son, and she named him Reuben, which means see a son. For she said, because the Lord has seen my humiliation and affliction, now my husband will love me. Verse 33, then Leah became pregnant again and bore a son and said, because the Lord heard that I am despised, he has given me this son also. And she named him Simeon, or God hears. And she became pregnant again and bore a son and said, Now this time will my husband be a companion to me, for I have borne him three sons. Therefore she named him Levi, which means companion. And then she conceived and bore a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. So she called his name Judah, which means praise. Then for a time she ceased bearing. Now what is so interesting if we just try to understand the context of this story, Leah was one of the daughters of Laban. She was the older daughter. He had a younger daughter called Rachel. Uh, the Bible is, is very clear and says that Leah was uh, not beautiful. In fact, it says uh, she had weak eyes. It says in verse 17, she had weak and dull eyes. She was, her eyes were not, you know, beautiful. But Rachel was beautiful and attractive. So already it's clear that the older sister was not as attractive, not as beautiful as the younger sister. Now, Laban humiliated Leah by giving her in marriage to Jacob when he didn't ask for her, or he, did, he, didn't, he had not 
the, the, the daughter that uh, Jacob had asked for in marriage was, and whom he had thought he had you know, married, was Rachel. So Leah knows that her father is, is basically brokering this deal to get two daughters, to get out of one uh, agreement two daughters, and the two daughters were going to bring two dowries. So the father, Laban, is not thinking about the feelings of Leah or thinking about, you know, how this is going to, uh, to be a very negative situation for her. He's only thinking about himself and he's thinking about getting an extra dowry out of his older daughter who's not married. So he, he deceives Jacob and he gives Leah his daughter without her consent. Uh, she had no control or, you know, over the situation. So it's a very humiliating thing for Leah to be given by her father without her consent to this man, Jacob, who doesn't really want her. He wants, you know, the other sister. So it shows us that probably the, her relationship with her father wasn't a good relation. I can't imagine any father doing something that is so, so selfish and, and, and absolutely not in the interest of his daughter. It was totally selfish and it was, it was, it was not about Leah, it was about him. So probably they, they didn't have a very good relationship. And now, all her life she has been under her father's care. And now her father has basically, you know, just sold her for her dowry to this man. And then she comes into this marriage already at a disadvantage. She knows that she is not really wanted. Now, when she comes into this marriage, the person who is wanted is not even somebody who is far away from her. The person who she's being rejected for is her sister. So it's very, very close and very, very painful. In fact, it's clear that when Jacob finds out that this, that he has received, gotten Leah instead of Rachel, he, you know, he's, he's, he's upset. He goes and talks to Laban and so imagine the, 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 the way this woman feels. Her father has humiliated her. And now, the person whom she, she has been given to in marriage has also rejected her at the very beginning. And then she enters a marriage situation that is, is from the beginning, is, is, is fraught with, 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 with jealousy, with competition, uh, with her sister, and, and, and striving for the affection, the acceptance, and the love of this husband. Um, the situation only gets worse when she's married. She's married, and from the beginning, it shows her that she is uh, unwanted, and she's not the choice, the first choice. She is in an inferior position to her sister, Rachel, and has to compete for her husband's attention. Now, God, why I find it so interesting is that God sympathizes or he has compassion on Leah because he realize, he, he sees that she has no uh, control over the situation. She's being traded and, and, and sort of moved around and she has no say in what's happening. So in verse, 10, it's, it, in verse 31 it says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was despised, he made her be able to bear children. But Rachel was barren. So God gives her, um, he gives her a, a, a something, a sense of security that she's looking for in, in, in bearing children. And he gives her the, the ability or the blessing of having children. So Leah bears her first son and she calls him Reuben, which means, see, I have a son. So, and she says, because the Lord has seen my humiliation and affliction, now my husband will love me. So probably she's waiting for uh, the birth of this child and she's hoping and praying that she can have a son because she feels that if she has a son, then her security in her marriage will be, you know, um, will be sure she will have a, a, a place in her husband's affection. She'll have a place in the family if she can bear a son. And then she gets a son and she calls him Reuben, which means, see, I have a son, or finally, I have a son, or finally the, the security that I'm looking for, or, or what the, the thing that she was craving, she felt that she had finally got it in, in, this, in the birth of a son. Probably the situation didn't change much because we see that she conceives again and then she bears a second uh, son. And she calls his name Simeon, which means God hears. 
and she says, God has seen that I am despised. He has given me a son, and she calls him Simeon. So it, it just shows, if you see that her journey, it just shows that her hopes uh, in, in the fact that she, if she has children, if she has sons, then it will give her security in her marriage. Then it will give her security uh, with her husband. Then she will, she will be accepted and loved and, and, and you know, appreciated. Through the naming of her, of her children, you see that it's not a happening. It's likely that it was not happening and the situation was the same or even getting worse. Uh, Jacob loved Rachel and um, even if Leah was having all these children, it did not change his attitude or his, you know, affection towards her. It didn't make, her, it didn't make him, you know, love her because she was having these children. So she continues and uh, she conceives and, 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 and bears a, a third son. And um, she calls his name Levi. And, and what I found I find so um, interesting is that the word Levi, the name Levi means a companion. And she says, now this time, my husband will be a companion to me, for I have borne him three sons. Every time she has, she's uh, pregnant or when she conceives, she's, her hopes are in, in the fact that now, because you always see in every verse where they're talking about a, a, a new birth or a new pregnancy, they, she, she, her, her hope was that now, this time, this time, the first time with Reuben, she said now, Second time with Simeon, it's now. Third time with, with uh, Levi, it is now. And her hopes are all um, based on the fact that now maybe her relationship with her husband, her security, what she's craving for will be realized with the birth of, of, the son, of, of this child. But we see that none of her hopes have been, you know, her desires have been fulfilled in that she has been looking to this man, Jacob, her husband, to, to give her a sense of acceptance and worthiness and, and, and just um, identity and a place. And every time she puts her hope in Jacob, her hopes are dashed, her hopes are crushed. She is deeply disappointed and she sees that she will never get what she wants from this person. He is not able to give her what she needs. So she finally has her fourth son, which is very interesting. Verse 35, it says, and she conceived and bore a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. So she called his name Judah, which means praise. So after this whole journey of, of, of deep disappointment, and we cannot even, we cannot begin to understand the depth of her, her disappointment, the depth of her pain, the depths of her, her sense of rejection. But finally, she takes her eyes off of Jacob because Jacob has been a disappointment. Her father was a disappointment to her. So all in, in, in all these uh, interactions, human interactions, she has, she has had only pain and rejection and disappointment and humiliation. So when she has her fourth son, she recognizes that, you know what? God has blessed me. God has given me these children. It's not, it's not Jacob who has given me the children. It's, children. it's not Laban who has given me these children. It is God who has given me these children. And so when she has her fourth son, she says, now, and this is again, this is a very interesting thing. She says, now, she turns her eyes away from all her surroundings and the things that she had put in a position of God in her life. And she, she, she turns her eyes away from all that and she says, now will I praise the Lord. And I believe that that decision where she felt she had come to the end of herself and the end of where, where all of her, her hopes had, had faded in, in, in Jacob and in their, their situation and in, 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 the, in, human, in, in, the, in, in the human relations. Now she just put all of her focus on, okay, I'm, let me just look to God. I've looked to all these people and they have, you know, failed me and, and, and disappointed me. Now, let me look to God. And what is so interesting, God honored Leah. And that son, Judah, who was the fourth son, who was at the end of her journey of, of, of you know, having these sons, he became the beginning. He became the first. 
he became a new beginning for her. So what does Judah mean if we look at this? It's a, it's a deeply personal story that any of us can, can relate to because all, all through life, there are things that we look to, that we, that, we, um, that we put our hopes in. It could be a person, it could be you know, a, a, a job, it could be you know, a relationship. It, whatever it is that we put our hopes in, just like uh, Leah had put her hopes in, uh, these relationships, her, her marriage, her, her father, those things that we look to that are apart from God, eventually there's, a, there's always a possibility that, that they will disappoint, that they will fail. But Leah came to the end of herself, and when she came to the end of herself and had exhausted all of her human options, she finally looked to God and put all of her hope in God. And, and when she came to the end of herself, that was the place where God began. It means that there is a new beginning when we come to the end of ourselves. That when we exhaust all of our human efforts and, 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 and strength and ability and might, and at that place where we, we think that we have ended is actually the place where God begins. Judah was the place where she ended, but it was the place that God started. And what is amazing, what we'll see is that the smallest thing that you give to God, the thing that seems, when you feel at your weakest, but if when you give that to God, that God can take what it seems so small and create, um, create not just a dynasty, not just um, a, a lineage, not just a kingdom. God can create something far, far greater than we ever imagined if we just give him that little thing that, that we are holding on to. Judah means taking our eyes off of the arm of flesh. Now this is a very, very big point of struggle for, for us as, 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 as believers because, because we are flesh and because we are made in, you know, in flesh, we, we are, our form is in flesh, there is always that it's almost like a, a need to, to see something tangible, physical. So, and that's why faith is, is, is something that, 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 that is sometimes hard because God is asking us to believe in something we can't see. And so many times we, we, we look for the, the things that are tangible, the arm of flesh. It can be a person, it can be uh, a relationship, it can be a job, it can be uh, a, you know, a car, something tangible, something physical, something that, that we can see. So one of the big, big, big um, tests in our walk with God is, are we going to trust in the arm of flesh or are we going to trust in, in the Lord? Leah had been so disappointed by the arm of flesh. She had been so disappointed, disappointed by looking to human beings to satisfy her or to, to give her a sense of security that she looked to God as a, as a last resort. But it is a battle that every Christian, every believer will have to, to face. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, it says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the strong man who trusts and relies on frail man, making weak human flesh his arm, and whose mind and heart turn aside from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub or a person naked and destitute in the desert, and he shall not see any good come, but shall dwell in the parched places in the wilderness, in an uninhabited, uninhabited salt land. And blessed is the man who believes in, trusts, and relies on the Lord, and whose hope and confidence the Lord is, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters that spread out its roots by the river, and it shall not see any fear when heat comes, but its leaf shall be green, it shall not be anxious and full of cares in the year of drought, nor shall it cease yielding fruit. So God here is very, very clear. He's talking about trusting in the arm of flesh, trusting in, you know, whatever is in our human capacity, and trusting in, in the Lord. And he gives a very, you know, very 
vivid picture. When you trust in, in, in the arm of flesh, when you trust in your human capacity and your own you know, abilities or in the abilities of the people that you are looking to or the things or the systems or whatever it is that you think is going to, to satisfy your, your needs or your desires, those things, they, 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 they basically shrivel up and die. It's so, so, so vivid that he says you'll be like a person who's naked and destitute in the desert. Naked and destitute in the desert. That is just saying that you will be exposed. You will be exposed, you will be, um, you will be uh, ashamed. Um, it says you shall not see any good come and you shall dwell in, a, in, a par in, the, in the parched places of the earth. Now, that's exactly what Leah had experienced. She had felt destitute, she had felt naked, she had felt exposed, and she had not seen any good come. But when she took her eyes off of the arm of flesh, she began to see a different, experience something different. It says you will be, you will be like a tree that is planted by water that spreads out its, its roots by the river, and it shall not see uh, fear when heat comes, it shall not be anxious, and it shall not see the yielding fruit. Now this is something that was fulfilled literally in the life of Leah and we'll just be looking at that very soon. Judah means looking to God instead of man. When Leah stopped looking to Jacob, when she stopped looking to Laban, when she stopped looking to those things and those people that she thought would give her a sense of security, when she started looking to God, her life changed. Her life was transformed. God gave her a place that her father couldn't give her, that her husband couldn't give her, that her children couldn't give her. God gave her a place that only God could give her. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us look away, look away from, from man and the things that we, are, we, we look to to give us a sense of, of, of identity and purpose and meaning and, 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 and you know, a, a sense of who we are. Leah, when she looked and started fixing her eyes on God, fixing her eyes on Jesus, her life turned around. Her life was changed. Finally, Judah means magnifying and worshiping God regardless of the circumstances. Leah praised God. She, her, the name Judah means to praise. So she praised God above her circumstances. And when she praised God above her circumstances, God lifted her above her circumstances. Many times when we begin to look to God, when we begin to turn away from the, the arm of flesh, when we begin to focus our eyes on God, when we come to the end of ourselves, we are praising God by faith. Maybe we haven't seen the situation change. Maybe we haven't seen the, the manifestation of the promise. It, it's, it hasn't yet come. But when we begin to praise God in those circumstances, still in that situation, and we see that all through scripture, that situation, begins to change. God lifts us from being under the circumstances to being above the circumstances. Amen. Psalm 34 verse 3 says it very, puts it very well. Psalm 34 verse 3 says, Oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and required him and he heard me and delivered me from all my fear. They who look to him are radiant their faces shall never be put to shame. So this is just confirming what we have been sharing. Magnify the Lord with me. Lift God up above my circumstance. When we begin to lift God up above our circumstances, just like Leah began to praise God above her circumstances. Nothing had changed. The situation was still the same, but her focus had changed. And she began to praise God within her circumstances. And God lifted her up. God lifted her up above her circumstances and uh, exactly what Psalm 34 says, those who look to him are radiant, their faces shall never be put to shame. Amen. So how does uh, Leah's situation change as we just begin to close? God entered into her situation and that's what really touches me about this story, that this story could have gone either way. Who knows where the lineage of, of Jesus Christ was supposed to come from. Maybe it was supposed to come through Rachel. She was the more sort of natural candidate. But it's interesting that, that, that God 
um, the, the, the God says that if you honor me, I will honor you. And that his word is for whosoever will. So when Leah turned to God, because all of her hopes and had, 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 had been, you know, dashed, had been disappointed. So she looks to God as a sort of a last resort. But God has compassion on her and he enters into her, her situation. And as she puts her hope in him, he begins to turn around the situations of her life. And he begins to turn them around in such a, a profound and powerful way because they have eternal significance. He changes things not just in her own life, but, he, but, but all the way down in history. So that today, we are still talking about this woman who was traded in marriage by her father and rejected by her husband. That is something that no human being could, could do. God honored her far, far beyond her circumstances. God honored her first above her sister because she was in this battle with her sister. And um, God showed that it is not necessarily the, the, the natural endowments that we have, what it can be physical beauty or maybe you're very smart, you're very intelligent, you have to, you know, you get good grades, or maybe even your family background is, 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 is you come from a great family, or your education. He, he, God shows in this situation that it's not necessarily those things that set you up for success. That you can have all those things, as, 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 as we see between um, Leah and Rachel. Rachel was the one who, was, who had you know, more of, of these traits that, 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 would, that, that we would think would, would, would give her success in life. All Leah had was God. That was what she had in her favor. Rachel had a lot of things in, in, in her favor, a lot of things um, stacked on her side. Leah was overwhelmingly, had a lot of uh, cons on her side. But when she turned to God, God came on her side. And it's amazing that God honored this sister, who, who was this, this woman, who was sort of seen as inferior. God honored her above her, 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 her sister, um, Rachel. Because we know the story of, of, of Jacob and, and, and Leah and Rachel. Rachel dies um, as she's giving birth to her second child and um, she dies on her way to, uh, to, this, to the land, to, to the promised land that they, were, that they were moving towards. Leah, on the other hand, goes on to have seven children, um, six sons and one daughter. She lives out her days. At the end of her life, she's buried in the same cave, in the same burial, family burial ground with Jacob, that Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. So God honored her. He honored her life. He honored her even in, in death. God honored her above other women because he made her the channel for the Messiah's lineage. That is a, a very, very, um, that is a very uh, unique position to be given. It was not because of anything in the natural, really, that, that sort of set her up. It was simply because she chose to praise God, simply because she chose to, to look to God, simply because she chose to, to come to the end of herself. And just that, that act, that simple act of, of looking to God, of, of, of fixing her eyes on God, God honored her immensely, and she became a channel for the line of the coming Messiah. God showed her the love of a father. God showed her the love of, of a father. Because we were, as we were talking in the beginning, we saw that her father humiliated her and her husband rejected her. But God showed that he is able to even restore all that because he showed her the love of a father. And he showed her that even when the one, her husband who was supposed to uh, love her and accept her, rejected her, he showed her the love of a, of a father and also the love of her husband because he pursued her even though no one else did. He showed her the love of a father by ensuring that the royal line of David would come through her. He fought for her. He fought for her place. He fought for her honor. He fought for her name. He fought for her. It's an amazing 
just an amazing thought that God would, 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 would take such steps, that God would, take, would, would get personally involved in this very, very seemingly small family drama. But because this woman trusted God, praised God, put her focus on God, 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 Almighty God, the eternal God, the, 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 the ancient of days, he came in and he came in in a, in a very, very grand way. Her son Judah became the preeminent tribe in Israel, so much that Jesus, the Son of God, is called the Lion of Judah. So we see that out of the twelve, who all had blessings, who all had this sort of uh, blessing of, 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 of the sons of the tribes of, of Israel, the sons of Jacob, but out of those, Judah. Why Judah? God just blessed them. God, God decided that this this tribe, this son, is going to be different. It's going to be special. Why? Because that was the point at which Leah looked to God. Have you looked to God? Have you come to the end of yourself? Have you come to the end of your, your, your strength and your, your, your human machinations and your, your abilities and your, the arm of flesh? And Because true praise, the essence of praise is when you come to the end of yourself and you say, now will I praise God. Now will I praise Him. I have been fighting this battle. I've been fighting for my life. I've been fighting for my family. I've been fighting for this position. I've been fighting for this place. I've been fighting for acceptance. I've been fighting. But now I will praise God. This time I will praise God. That time becomes the beginning. That becomes your Judah. That becomes the place in which God, get God, the, the, the almighty God, the ancient of days, uh, the Most High God comes into your, your situation, your circumstance. And we have seen that God can turn around our seemingly small situations, our life situations, in such an e eternal way that, that our lives be, have eternal significance, that our lives have a, a, an eternal impact. Because even today, we're talking about this woman who lived thousands of years ago and the decision that she made. All this from a woman who was called ugly, who was humiliated by her father and unloved by her husband. God gave her the ultimate victory. God gave her the ultimate turnaround of her situation. Therefore, the essence of praise is coming to the place where we say, now, now will I praise God. Judah means, I put God for Judah means, I will magnify God above myself. Judah means I will magnify God above my circumstance. Judah means I come to the end of all of my striving and now I will praise God. God cannot resist giving spectacular victory to those who have a Judah moment, who have a Judah, who come to a, a Judah place in their lives and choose to praise God. I believe that all of us at different levels and at different places in our lives have struggles, have struggles that are very personal, just like Leah had struggles. But what, what, why I love this story is because it just shows how, um, how intimate God is with us, how, how deep, how, 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 how personal He can get, that He can enter into this very, very personal struggle that someone who seems insignificant, somebody who doesn't seem very important, that he can give her such significance and such importance. My friends, I believe that that is the, the essence of, of praise. It's not just singing a song. It's not just, um, you know, singing a hymn. It is saying, now, this time, this time, I have come to the end of my, I have come to the end of, of my, my striving and my fighting and my working and my fighting to, to have a place and to be accepted and to be taken seriously and to be now, I'll praise God. And inviting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Ancient of Days to come into our circumstance, to come into even the things that are not right in our lives and asking Him to come and magnifying Him above. That is an invitation that the Lord cannot resist because He said, send Judah up because I have delivered the land to him. That just means that when we praise God, when we magnify him, when we lift him up and declare that now I'm, we're going to, to look to him and focus on him, and God gives us spectacular victories.
He has already given the victory when Judah goes up. Heavenly Father, Lord, I believe that every one of us has our own personal struggles. We have our deep and intimate struggles that maybe we don't talk about, and maybe we don't share about, and maybe few people know about. But Lord, you know and you see all things. And I believe that you are calling us to lay down our fight and our struggle, to lay down our seeking to, to be accepted and to be, um, to be given a place when we're fighting for ourselves and fighting for our right. Heavenly Father, whether it's on a family level, whether it's in, in the workplace, whether it's um, uh, in, in the church, in our communities, whether it's in marriages, Father, whether it's children in their families or in their schools, or Father, I want, I want, whether it's even on a national level, Father, all of us have our battles. And so today, Lord, as we, we have looked at this story of this woman who had so much stacked against her, but who saw such a dramatic turnaround of her, her life and her situation, a spectacular victory that you gave her, a resounding victory that still speaks to this day. Father, we're asking you to come into our situation. And we want to declare today in the name of Jesus that now, now this time, maybe the last time and the, the times before we have been trying to do it our own way, trying to live and, and, and work out our lives our own way, trying to get solutions and answers and, and results in our own might. But Lord, like Leah today, we will say, now we will praise God. Now we will magnify you above our circumstances. And so Father, we invite you to come. Even as you said, send up Judah first. Lord, as we, as we worship you and praise you and magnify you, Lord, we pray that you will deliver your victory, that you will deliver the, our enemies into our hands and that you will give us a spectacular turnaround in our lives. We bless you and we praise you. We have prayed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.